Um, so, thanks for your perseverance. <laughs> um, I thought I'd, well, anyway, today's lecture is about um, the, the moduli space of genus G uh, Riemann surfaces or curves. Um, associated space genus G Riemann surfaces plus n ordered punctures. Okay. Um, okay. Um, so maybe as, as I was talking about stability theorems, I thought I'd just mention, well, actually, maybe I'll just say um, you can build in several ways these things. Um, one, of course, is, is using uh, geometric invariant theory. Mumford and Deline. And what you get is um, the compactification MGN bar um, by what's called stable curves. Now, it's, it's a sort of curious um, terminology in some ways because a lot of, of uh, geometric invariants, you start with a set of geometric objects and you throw some out, the ones that aren't stable. Um, here, stable means that you're actually adding some stuff in. Um, so what you're adding, basically, are curves with nodal singularities. Singularities. And only... Um, Finite number of automorphisms, basically. So, for example, um, returning to our bubble of the other day, this would be not be stable because this this thing would have a about a certain number of automorphisms. On the other hand, if you put if you're looking at punctured curves and you put two two points from your thing, that, that would kill the automorphism. So that, that would be OK in MG2, but it wouldn't be OK in, uh, in uh, MG. Now, um, yes, was other comments. The points, the labeled points, stay, have to live far from the nodes. OK. So that's, that's one way. But there's another way that actually sort of um, allows for, uh, I mean, the, the two give you a sort of Teichmuller theory. So you can use one analysis. And um, you get mg to be, say, tau g, uh, Teichmuller space mod um, gamma g. So this is the You have the mapping class group. So here you're you're considering sort of extra structure. You're fixing, basically, a, a uh, an isotopy class of an of an isomorphism with a fixed smooth curve in your in your structure. So you're putting extra structure in, and this would be the space of all diffeomorphisms mod the space of those that are isotopic to the identity. And so what this is doing actually is bringing bringing in smooth. Um, brings in smooth uh, theory, if you want. And, well, maybe I'll, it's instead of smooth theory, I'll just say homotopy theory, because that's sort of what actually, in some sense, helps. You see, this is a contractible space. It's a mapping class group. 
um, finite stabilizers. So it's not quite a classifying space, but it's 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 enough to get rational results, and that's that's uh, the source of one of the the um, the um, results, which is the the sort of error. Uh, stabilization, which essentially says that uh, do up or lower doesn't really matter for Q. Really. Um, for, let's see, star less or equal to something like one-half of g minus one. Okay. So you're seeing, in other words, you stabilize with respect to the genus. Now, how would you do this? Well, in, in general, sort of difficult, but here, basically, if you're sort of working the commodity, you just sort of isolate a piece, and then you can sort of contract that. And so you can sort of move back and forth from the. In other words, you use you use the smooth, the possibilities, extra possibilities given you by by uh, being in a category where you can deform. Um, <clears throat> the big result from from recent years was this Mumford um, conjecture by Matson and Weiss. So this thing's going to a limit, and um, it's going to be a polynomial ring in generators um, Okay, each generator k ki is of degree 2i. So um, <coughs> Kappa classes, which I won't define, but the they, um, your your uh, spaces. So in other words, it's behaving a lot like the the moduli spaces of of instantons that we discussed before. Um, no, you fix n. Yeah. Actually, uh, sorry, maybe um, yeah. Excuse me. Makes sense. I'm not sure if there's a, there must be a result for the the end, but I must admit I didn't uh, write it down. Okay. The the stabilization is for all n, and um, this is well. I think it's the same same range for all n, but I I might have to check. Anyway, so so that's the um, thing. Now, what I want to do is today is sort of a different direction. Okay, um, and this is for n greater than zero. Um, has uh, natural line bundles. Um, Li equals one to n. Um, and uh, the way they work is that um, I've got to tell you what it is over a point. So I've got a Riemann surface sigma and my n mark points, and it's just the cotangent bundle. So this this should be a vector, a line, a line, complex line, and it's going to be the cotangent bundle, obviously a complex cotangent bundle of sigma at the point pi. So you build a line bundle on the whole moduli space from simply considering at each curve with its mark points, the cotangent bundle at that point. Hmm? 
No. No, no, you get a separate one for each. Yeah. There's a separate one for each, each eye. Okay, and the, these, of course, the points are basically, they're only distinguished by a labeling. So they're, they're sort of naturally isomorphic in, in the obvious, sort of under the, the action of the, the symmetric group. Um, and in fact, we're getting things, we're going to, any statement is, has to be, the statements we're going to make have to be sort of somehow symmetric. Okay, and <clears throat> they, they sort of extend to MGN bars, so some sort of orbifold widget, but enough to, to at least make a computation of degree finite. And you compute integrals. So T D1 and the N. Um, and that's going to be the integral on MGN of um, psi. Oh, oops. I forgot one essential definition. Sorry. These things will have a churn class, which I'll call psi i. And now that I've said that, you can compute integrals. OK, so um, psi 1 d1, psi n to the dn to be the integral on MGN of psi 1 to the d1. Damn. My notations are all wrong. Sorry, this should be tau. So these are super subscripts. So I, this is just a symbol, but this is what it is. You take the product of these forms. These are two forms, so the order doesn't matter. Um, and the integral, well, this, this might not match. Um, one extra detail, maybe. Uh, the dimensions would be 3g minus 3. It would be 3g minus 3 plus n. Okay. So if, uh, so if you can find a genus for which this works, you notice the n is specified here because you, you've got n punctures. So if the sum of the di is equal to 3g minus 3 plus n, and 0 otherwise. So in other words, if you've chosen uh, di's and you, you've chosen n of them, so the n is fixed. And if you've chosen di's that don't match a g, result zero. Okay, but in, in any case, it's always you always have a number. Okay. Now then, you do the following crazy thing: you combine them. Um, So you get a function in an infinite number of variables, which will be the sum over all di's of, well, maybe I'll put it the sum over all n and the sum over all all di's. Um, 1 over n factorial, tau d1, tau dn, t sub d1, t sub dn. So it's, it's fairly subtle in the sense that the, the notation actually includes the symmetry. So the, for example, the tau 0 cubed term here would be the integral, the t0 cubed term here would be the integral tau 0, tau 0, tau 0. Okay. And these are obviously symmetric, and that sort of gets reflected because the order of the product doesn't matter as they're polynomials. 
Okay, so you combine this into this weird function and the uh, theorem is that if you take um, this, you, this solves the KDV hierarchy. Um, so, let's see, maybe I should write a few of them. So it's an infinite number of ODEs, or PDEs, rather. Um, So d over t d t i is equal to d d over t zero of some function r i of u, which is a the r i is a t zero differentiable differential polynomial. So, for example, if I set um, prime to be d over d t zero, I get d um, u over d t1 is um, 3 halves of u squared plus 1 quarter u double prime, the whole thing primed. Um, So this is the original KDV, but there's an infinite number of um, PDEs, and the, the, they commute in the sense that you can solve them simultaneously. Um, so I'll just write out another one, 15 eighteenths u cubed plus 5 twelves u u double prime plus 148 u triple prime. And there's an infinite hierarchy of these things. Um, now to get an idea of how weird this is, this, this equation governs shallow water waves. <laughs> right? <laughs> okay, so these things were extensively studied by, by people doing um, um, well, doing integral PDE, it sort of starts the theory of integral PDEs in some sense. In the, in the 1970s, there's a whole sort of way of seeing these as, a, as an infinite dimensional integrable Hamiltonian system. There's, there's all sorts of structure here that, that has been developed. And um, the theorem, um, which is conjecture of Witten, and proven by Konsevich. Um, well, it says that you, you do this thing with the moduli space of, of Riemann surfaces, and you get um, um, <clears throat> get these things. Now, this is not just a, an isolated artifact, there, there are several other cases for which you take these integrals and you put them together in a series like this and you concoct a solution to an integrable hierarchy. So um, if you do the same thing with the gromov witten invariance, I think for P1 you get the two toda. Uh, that's that's um, Kunkov and Pandey Pandey. Um, you can do various sort of similar things with Horowitz. There, there are all these these things, and they it's just very strange, really. Um, that, in some sense, is, is part of the uh, part of the mystery. 
So what I'd like to do is basically show you. Sorry, yeah. Well, it d d depends how you define good. Uh, okay, any reason. Any reason? Well, I, 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 my, I, I'm sort of claiming, I guess, that there, I'm, this is, like I said, this lecture is an aim to share my confusion. Um, now, there are a bunch of infinite dimensional spaces which are sort of tied to this, and they should be linked in some way. And I'll sort of get to that at the end, but there's no clear, Thing. Witten's statement basically when he makes a conjecture is I've got two theories of gravity, one associated random matrices and that's tied in a sort of computational way to the KDV. Not a, you know, there should, there should be some geometry there. I'm, I'm fairly sure that's not too, too hard. And then he's got this model built basically from the, from the MGNs, sort of a discrete network model built on the Riemann surfaces and No, no, that's the point. All he says, well, gravity's gravity, guys. So it's got to give the same result. Now maybe there's, there's you know, further developments, but I, I, don't, I don't know them. But if you look every time, what it is, is in some sense, it's working out sort of, I mean, what does is, what is a, a differential operator do here? It shifts, shifts degrees by one or two or whatever. Okay, but it shifts degrees. So you're moving from one moduli space to the other. Okay, now sort of work here with a sort of geometry and do the operations here. And then you show that, you know, it's okay. It sort of corresponds. Fine. But there should be a, a sort of deeper reason. And then you've got some very odd things going on, after all. You've got, um, you're summing, basically you're summing over all possibilities of number of functions. You're also summing over all genera. Right, so this is infinite limit of, of things that aren't too linked. So uh, there should be some good infinite dimensional geometry that is somehow at least tying it together, but it's a little <coughs> bit odd. Okay. Okay, so I thought I'd, I'd at least outline um, Gonsevich. By the way, there, there's, there's a nice book by uh, um, Alvarado called An Alba and, and Griffiths that, that, uh, that actually does, I think, a much clearer job of explaining uh, what's going on. Okay. So, um, but I'd at least give you an idea of the, the ingredients and how they're sort of coming in. So, proving it. So there, there are about seven steps. So here goes. Um, the first is, is getting a good parameterization of moduli space. And that involves, there are two ways of doing this, maybe more. One, you can do sort of hyperbolic geometry on the curve. And the other involves so-called stable differentials, which is actually a very pretty um, so what do you do? You look at quadratic differentials. On um, the Riemann surface. Um, and you have poles of the functors. Okay, so you've got an expression 5z bz squared. Okay, and this does two things for you. One, it gives you a metric, a flat metric, actually. Which in, in coordinates basically is just 5z squared, well, dx squared plus dy squared, in the obvious sense. Okay? 
The second thing it does is give you, uh, gives you a foliation. Okay. Um, basically what you're doing is um, if you feed a vector into this, a real vector, this has complex entries. This has complex entries. So it's going to spit out. If you put in, say, 5z bz squared, and you contract with a pair of EV, OK, this gives you, gives you a complex number. OK, but there will be um, one direction where the number is real. OK? so. Um, So you ask that this be real. Okay. Um, so a Strabel differential is one where almost all leaves are circles. Um, those which are not form a graph, okay, with um, basically the vertices will be the zeros of um, phi. So you get a following picture of a, of a Riemann surface. Um, as this sort of rather primitive thing. Um, imagine you're, you're being given a, a bunch of stove pipes and told them to glue them together and make a surface of them. And that's, that's what you're, you're getting. And so you can have the, the punctures will be out here. It's flat, so they're all circles. Actually, each, each sort of piece would be a circle of the same length. And this, this sort of funny geometry where things are glued together. Um, another comment, the vertices, the valence of the, of the vertex is the order of the zero. plus 2. So simple zeros mean it's trivalent. OK, so the, in, in fact, you know, if you're going to have a graph, the, the somehow the generic graph should be trivalent. That's what it's saying. Because the generic quadratic differential will have zeros um, elsewhere. But there's an even more remarkable theorem, which is the uh, theorem due to Strabel, is you fix uh, perimeters. Pi at the punctures. Okay, I should say at the punctures. If you're allowing a pole, what happens is that these things are infinite cylinders. Um, so maybe I'll use you know, I'll use pi for perimeter. That makes sense. Um, there exists a unique. Um, Strabel differential, OK, such that all, um, all the cylinders are, if you want, infinite and end at the punctures. end at infinity at the punctures with, of course, the, the i-th I cylinder 
um, having perimeter. Pi. Okay, so you, you, in other words, this picture is not good because this one has a little finite cylinder sort of stuck in the center. You, that, that one's out. So, but you can find things, so there's a unique one, and you get a sort of picture. Of course, there's, there's a, one, one rapidly sort of explores the limits of one's uh, graphic capacities. But if you're doing a three punctured sphere, for example, okay, and I fix a perimeter, at each puncture, um, you get something that, okay, you get a three, three punctures. And you notice if you've got a perimeter P1, and a perimeter P2, and out here P3, then on the sort of finite pieces here, on the, the edges of this graph, you're getting lengths, I don't know, L2, L3 and L1, and L2 plus L3 is P1 plus cyclic. Okay, so you're getting the, the lengths here, basically, or the lengths out here. All right, so this is uh, sort of limits to the, this is, after all, a singularity of the metric, so one shouldn't be thinking of this as quite um, in, its, uh, in its Euclidean picture. Okay, so, so you get these, these pictures, and sort of what's, what's intriguing um, is basically, once you realize that, that the lengths, the perimeters out here are just given by the lengths here, you can basically just give the graph and its lengths, and you specify a Riemann surface. Okay. Now I should say, for example, these, these are when these, these perimeters, basically because of these, these relations, they have to satisfy a sort of triangle inequality. You could have, um, let's see, a, a, this would be a graph that looks trivalent. The graph is, is basically looks like this. Okay. But you could have a, a graph that looks like that and you'll have two regions here, and the other region is the, the complement of this and, and is longer than the sum of the other two. Okay, so you'll have a, I put lengths on here, L, A, L prime. The first perimeter is L prime, the second is L, and the third is L plus A plus L prime plus A, because that's the, the one that's out there. Okay, so you, you'll get, as you vary your perimeters, different graphs. But basically, once you can, you can fix, you take a graph and you fix the lengths. And, uh, you get a Riemann surface. The other comment, perhaps, is the graphs have a cyclic order. At the edges. Um, But if you choose a graph with the cyclic order, so there's, they're called ribbon graphs for that reason. Okay, so they're, they're, they've got a, they're slightly more rigid. You can think of them as sort of fattened here at the edges. You can choose graphs, then choose lengths. of edges, get sigma with, with perimeters. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so, um, 
basically what you get is a description of MGN as a disjoint, disjoint union. Um, now I'm going to write it as, first of all, trivalent ribbon graphs. Um, <clears throat> with n regions. Okay, so these are rather like planar graphs. There's a, there's a natural way of finding the regions because there's um, and they fill into a genus G curve to genus G. Okay, so you can compute a genus and compute a, a number of punctures. And then you have the set of lengths L1 to L I don't know, let's say k long to r plus to the k. And the constraint, of course, is the sum of the lengths i belong to the, so the edge i has to, bounding the ith region, bounding, say, alpha th region, well, that has to be equal to your perimeter p alpha. Okay, so you get this description of this. So you've got the trivalent graphs, and you'll get others. It will be non-trivalent. But this is the generic case, and so this is of measure zero. If you're doing integrals, you don't worry about them. Okay, so everything gets concentrated on these trivalent graphs. So it's a very explicit description. Um, the other thing that he, Konsevich, builds is something he calls the combinatorial version of the classifying space for line bundles. Okay? And what you do, basically, is will be what? It'll be the union over all possible perimeters in R plus. The union now of the set union over N, okay, of the set of endpoints on S1 with perimeter P. So this is the perimeter. And you define an equivalence relation. Of course, well, disjoint in the sense of not topologically disjoint. This is a smooth family. The end points you have to get from N to N minus 1, basically. And you just eliminate repetitions. Okay, so the stratum is you take a perimeter, a certain number of points. Okay, and you can put, choose an orange in here, and the coordinate here will be phi 1, and it just the, take the length, phi 2, phi 3. This will be um, length from going to 1 to 2 will be L1. L3, and then if there are endpoints, this will be LN. Okay? And so those are the coordinates one use. Um, there's an obvious S1 action. You just rotate all the points. B1 
BU1 will just be EU1 mod S1. And the coordinates here are just the, the lengths. <coughs> now, um, given, given world enough in time, you can consider, you can convince yourself that this is contractible. always these things that sort of involves a certain amount of mental pain. But the, um, and the S1 action is free-ish. What, what that means is basically, how can the S1 action not be free? It'll be not be free if you have symmetric configurations of points. And then a rotation by, say, 1 over k, if they're k points, will will map the set to itself. Now, of course, that's happening on a small set. And it's always a stabilizer that is finite. And so somehow, rationally, this is OK. That's the, the and we're just doing integrals. So life is good. OK, we're not interested in the, in the sort of torsion part of the topology. So that's the, the um, <clears throat> the, uh, the statement. Now the other thing you've got is a, uh, a connection on it. So maybe, um, I'll just write it here. So on this bundle, this S1 bundle, to be a connection form. Um, no, I want that to call it. I'm going to call it alpha. And omega will be the associated curvature, which is a sum, let's see, 1 less or equal to i less or equal less than j less or equal to n minus 1. of ELI over P wedge ELJ over P. And that behaves like a connection form. Uh, a curvature, sorry. That's D alpha. Okay. Um, So basically, the, the statement is that the, the, um, the classifying map for Li is using your, your Strabel differentials. You've got a, a picture of your, your, your sort of infinite cylinder picture. Here's, here's your i puncture. And you've got a certain number sort of sitting way back here, you've got a circle with lengths L1, L2, L3, L4, L6, and lens. So way back, and this thing, the cylinder is going off to infinity, and you've got a graph with a bunch of lengths surrounding that cylinder. Okay? So that's, so from your graph, you had a certain number of lengths, and you just map it to L1, L2, L, K, whatever it is, around your circle. So this is going to take you, in other words, from the, the uh, 
graph with lengths, and you just map it to the lengths around the right circle. Okay, and it's a classifying map in the sense that C1, if you call this map, I don't know, um, what did I call it, rho i? C1 of Li is just going to be rho i pull back of that curvature form there. So in other words, this, this, expli this explicit description with the Strabo differentials also gives you, in a natural way, using this, this sort of slightly weird version of the classifying space, gives you the, the function as a pullback of a form that is extremely explicit. Okay. So that's the, the second thing. Now the third thing is just messing around on the graph. So maybe I'll just write the third step. You want to do a volume interval. Okay. So, um, I'm going to set omega of p, so that these perimeters will be the sum of pi omega i. Okay? And pull back to MGN. And, um, well, integrate. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to get a volume. MGN. Fix these perimeters again. It's going to be an integral on MGN. And I'll skip the pullbacks. Okay, um, omega d over d factorial, where d is the power that brings you to the top dimension. Okay, so it's going to be equal to um, 1 over d factorial, the integral on mgn of p1 omega 1 plus pn n to the d, okay? And then just because of the combinatorics of taking this power, it's actually going to have somehow involved in it all the, the tau's that you want. So it's be the sum d1 plus dn um, of the product over i of pi to the 2di. Oh, sorry, I missed a square here. You want to put squares. pi to the 2di over di factorial tau d1 tau dn. Because when you're taking this dth power, you're going to be choosing, you know, as you evaluate these things, you're choosing various factors in here and melting them together and getting this thing. So, in other words, as you're taking the dth power, you'll have chosen this one d1 times, uh, the second one d2 times, and so on. It's giving you these tau's. Okay, and then something which makes sense, I suppose, if you're doing anything else but geometry is you take a Laplace transform. So you take the Laplace transform of the volume, and you'll get an integral over R n minus lambda i pi e integral omega d over d factorial mgn of d p1 p2. 
VPN. Okay. And now you pull back these forms to each um, each of our you've partitioned, remember, your, your moduli space into pieces, open pieces corresponding to each of these trivalent graphs. So you look at now at, on the, each trivalent graph. And on the For each trivalent locus, and remember what you're doing, you're fixing the number of uh, regions, because that's the n. You're fixing now the um, valence of each vertex, because it's trivalent. And so basically, your number of edges is fixed. Um, and there's a weird combinatorial thing. One of the few known occurrences in mathematics of the number five. Um, and it's just the sort of volume form on the lengths of the edges up to this little weird factor here. And in fact, um, this number here is just minus the number of vertices. Okay. Okay. So you can reparameterize this as now a sum um, over the graphs in the trivalent graphs, genus G, n punctures. Okay, two to the minus number of the vertices of the graph. Now there's a little bit of a, um, a shuffle here because. Your description of the graphs actually has some redundancy because they're automorphisms here. So you have to take the automorphism, order of the automorphism group into account. So if you're just doing it on the graphs, you're actually doing it with a little bit of um, redundancy. So you have to divide by the order of the automorphism groups. Now each of these, this is apart from this factor here, it's just DL1 to DLK, and the perimeters here Remember, they're just sums of the LIs, right? So, um, but a subset for each perimeter. It's just the LIs that live around that, that, that region. Okay, so you then have to, in other words, if you're looking at your graph, okay, L1. Okay. You're looking at your um, your graph now. In in for say P1, your first perimeter will be the sum of these. Your second perimeter will be the sum of these, and basically each edge of the graph appears twice. One for the region on its its right hand side, if you orient it, and the other on its region on its left hand side. Okay, so. Um, Uh, the other thing to remember is the, the, let's see, how do I want to write this? Um, well, maybe I'll just write it. Uh, first is E to the minus and I, PI, uh, PL1 wedge PLK. Okay, so each of these perimeters is a sub sum of these lengths. And if you remember just the Laplace transform, oops, I forgot the, yeah. So the, the, the lambda is the sort of dual variable of the p's here, but the Laplace transform of a linear function is one over the 
linear function. And so once you work it out, we sum g, same stuff here, and then the, the interval just factors as a product over the edges of um, 2 over lambda e plus lambda e prime. Remember, these, are, these lambdas are associated to the punctures, but for each edge, you've got sort of lambda v1, lambda v1 prime here. So you've got a number here and a number there. It's associated to each edge. So it amounts to this when you do the Laplace transform. Okay, on the other hand, now if you do it directly, um, do the Laplace transform directly, okay, And um, you'll get that the sum equal d of tau d1 tau dn times the product 2di minus 1 double factorial over lambda i to the 2 di plus 1. But then that, that's equal to the thing that's over there, which is the sum, therefore, of these trivalent graphs gn 2 to the minus over the order of the automorphisms um, r2 over lambda e plus lambda e prime. Okay. And this is what Konsevich calls his basic combinatorial identity. So you've got your, identi your integrals here. You've taken your Laplace transform variables and now you um, Okay, so that's just for one fixed genus and one fixed n. And now you've got to put them all together. And again, it's a sort of weird idea, but it works. So maybe four. <coughs> Build in a matrix. And put the MGN together. Together. Okay, so that's the... Okay, so I'm just going to choose n be some large integer. Which, of course, will end up going to infinity. But you'll get, okay? And I'm going to set lambda to be the diagonal matrix and variable lambda 1 to lambda n. Um, Ti of lambda will be the sort of invariant polynomials uh, in some sense on these things, or yeah, I suppose you can raise well, one basis for it anyway. Um, so it'll be 2i minus 1 double factorial of the trace of 
lambda to the minus 2i plus 1. Okay. Um, so in other words, it's the sum sort of, I don't know, alpha equals 1 to capital N of um, lambda 1 to the minus 2i plus 1, yeah, lambda alpha plus, right? Okay, so you're, you're building this, you see a sort of matrix starting to appear here in these, in these matrix models. Okay, so that's the thing. You're going to sum, um, so that's going to build in a matrix. Now, this next, next thing you do is, given your graph, so your graph G, which has, already has its regions labeled 1, 2, 3, and so on, you add in an extra labeling. Okay, so in other words, you take a map, sigma, which takes a set one little n to one big n. And so this could have, um, I don't know, label 14. This has label um, 122, and so on. Okay, so you put in extra labels. And then we're going to sort of just rewrite the combinatorial entity, then sum over all possible labelings. So now you take this thing and sum over all labelings. And all G and N. Okay. And basically, it's going to give you um, GC will be these colored. And what it gives you in the end is your generating function, f, t0, t1. So you're seeing these variables appear as these transforms here. Okay, so it's a capital lambda, I suppose. So in other words, your, your edges here, product over edges, your edge here, you go this side, you go that way, you're on the first region, but that's associated, has the color 14 associated. This one has the color 122, so associated to that edge would be lambda 14 plus lambda 122. Okay, so it's a different, slightly different thing from here or there, but it's basically the same idea. Okay, so that's, you've now got a formula, and now you have to somehow link it to And that brings us to the world of, which is quite a wonderful world, actually, which physicists know and love, which is Gaussian integrals. Okay. So if I define the, the expectation of f to be the integral of f of x, say this is on Rn, e to the minus x minus a half, x transpose a x. So this is some, say, symmetric matrix. It's defining a Gaussian measure. I then integrate it, f over it, and I'm getting a, an expectation value. 
Okay. So um, the main thing to remember here is Wick's theorem. Just this basic sort of fact that if you're looking at the variables, just the, the straight coordinate variables, and you're taking the expectation of a product, I say L, this is going to be 0 for L odd. And it's going to be. Um, A sum over all pairings in the set I1 to IL of the expectation values of these pairings. So um, I don't know, I, S1, X, I, S2, X, I, S1. S3, um, Xi, S4, and so on. So your one integral balloons into L over 2 integrals, but over quadratic ones, so in some sense simpler. So that's, that's a calculation. It's not, it's not hard. And of course, it's absolutely basic to any, um, basically somehow all of, of uh, quantum physics is sort of based on this things, right? This is the, this is a, a free energy, basically. You've got an energy functional, you're, you're taking the, um, and so when, you, when you're doing the, the, the Feynman path integrals, that's sort of what it's, what it's about. This is a finite version, but it's, it's the same idea. And so you've got these, these um, and there's a link to graphs, which I admit here is kind of weak. But if I'm going to compute x to the 3i, OK? And I'm going to take i even, OK? What I do is I take. My pairings, how do I get my pairings? I take a whole bunch of trivalent diagrams like this. I may I'll do four of them. Okay? And I join them anyway. Done. I've skipped one. <laughs> Wait a minute. <laughs> what have I done wrong? <laughs> no, this makes no sense. Right? I've got an even number of vertices on the blackboard. Ah, yes, okay. This, this, that's wrong. Okay, I joined them pairwise. Okay, good. Oof. Okay, mathematics is consistent. Okay, so the, the key point is that all of a sudden, I've gone from a thing like this to a graph. And it's basically what the Feynman integral, the, the Feynman, I mean, it gets vastly decorated, it gets improved, it gets, but a lot of the, the sort of thing be, ends up being this. And um, so this is the tie, if you want, to graph enumeration which people in the, especially the French school, exactly, it's Ixen, uh, Zuber, uh, Di Francesco, and other people have used to get all sorts of nice results. And what they do basically is they, okay, they say the, the integrals, this is tied to graphs. On the other hand, and that's where things get a little bit wonky, physics voodoo tells you from another way that you can compute the thing. And you get asymptotics for these enumeration problems. Okay. Um, two colorings. 
So what happens when you color things? Remember, we've got n of them. OK? Yeah, so you take times, well, so sorry, you, you. Oh, sorry, this is equal to, yeah. So this, ah, okay, that's this is for L even. Oh, sorry. So L0, it's, it's zero for L odd and for L even. I mean, if you, you don't want the sort of one hanging around, so you, you want an even number, but then you, you pair them up and you, you compute them this way, then you take all pairings. Okay, so it takes us one integral to a sum. Mm. So what it's telling you is, is for higher order polynomial, you just need the quadratic one and everything else follows, but by, by some rather complicated combinatorics. Okay, what happens when you multiply a matrix? Okay, so I, J, J, K, right? Okay, so I, J, J, K. These are your colors. And so what happens basically is your links now have colors on them. So now each sort of blob is a, somehow a matrix, and then you're, you're getting, um, which I think you're getting pairs of colors. Anyway, I, all, all I wanted to say is that the sort of expanding this idea from scalars to matrices now gives you a, a graph that has colorings on it. So we had trivalent graphs, G, G3, and then basically the statement is that for computing F, what you want is the integral now over the n by n matrices. Actually, it's the Hermitian matrices. Okay. So I'm skipping stuff. Um, of e to the i over six trace of x cubed minus one-half of lambda x squared dx. Okay, so your lambda, or of course lambda is equal to lambda, no, sorry, t is equal to t of lambda. So your, your full, for n finite, this in, in introduces some algebraic dependencies between the t's because there's an infinite number of t's and there's only a finite number of lambdas. So on the other hand, you've left your n free. And so in some sense, when you let your go to n goes to infinity, you'll get your thing. Now, you might have noticed that you've got an x cubed. The, oops, is there an i here? Well, maybe that's what makes it converge. Let's cover. Okay, one of the issues, of course, is, is getting these things to converge. I had one version that just had the trace of x cubed, and that made sense as an asymptotic series, but not as a, because e to the x cubed, you just expand it as a series, and then you, polynomials you can do. Uh, but the i probably does make it converge. Okay. And again, it's through this, this stuff of thing. So, so at least you're getting a, you're getting a series. 
That's clear because you can just expand. Okay. And then so that was Gaussian integrals. Okay, then five is um, and then you get into the theory of Gaussian integrals and the deformations. See, this lambda can be thought as a deformation of the measure. And deformation of these matrix models often lands you in the world of the KDV equation. But um, So this is sort of the math physics world. Um, KDV. Now, it's actually done here through a, a different path, which is kind of an interesting, actually, in itself, is you get um, a Virasoro algebra of differential operators. Um, so these are operators Li. And basically, they, they, it's, it's the Lie algebra of the diffeomorphisms of the circle. So in other words, you take, take uh, Li to be z to the i minus 1 d over dzi, roughly, or d over, d over theta i, maybe. Right? It's, it's just the, um, the Fourier components of the vector field d over d theta. Okay, so you've got Li, uh, this, and it satisfies um, something like that. And there's an explicit differential operator, and you have to show, and it's, it's very painful and long, that somehow this L, these Ls kill this thing when they're applied to, to lambda here. And again, it's not a... Well, there's some ideas, but a bit unclear. And then there's a theorem um, well, you show in fact you you just need i greater or equal to minus one, um, which is good because if you have it let if you go to minus two and so on, there's the central extension term that kicks in and Life is hard, but um, in any case, here um, and then there's a theorem that's just manipulation, basically, and it tells you that um, plus the KDV equation for you. So that bit is, is manipulation. I don't think there's any sort of clear geometry in it. At least, maybe there is, but I haven't seen it. So you, you get, in other words, to your, you get from graphs to a matrix model using the Feynman graph theory, and then you sort of math physics kicks in, and you can use known results. But And so I'd just like to, to finish by sort of saying, well, where does the, the infinite dimensional geometry come? Which I think is sort of intriguing. I'm not sure exactly how. Yeah. So, sorry? Yeah. Sure. Well, it, uh, they're differential operators that are, in fact, of, of in an infinite number of variables, so all the TIs, and of order two. So they satisfy the relations of the 
but they're not, not acting that way, at least not, not directly. So it's some, some sort of derived object. But if you just set li, it's something like, something like that. I mean, you, you have to get the constants right, but. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll come to uh, uh, possibly. Okay. So, so the first thing is the the. Oops. Um. Still recording? Yeah. Okay. Good. Um. So infinite dimensional geometry. So one. Well, what have you got? You got trivalent. Um, ribbon graphs. So what do they have in common? Well, the trivalent, they have the same universal cover, which would be the trivalent ribbon tree. So in other words, you've got a, an infinite tree in the Plane and you put lengths on, and so on. Okay. So the question, I guess, is, you know, you've got localization formula, but for circle actions, here it's not a circle action. But where you're localizing over a fixed point sets, and incidentally, you get You've got circle action, you've got characters, so the parameters t appear naturally. Here, um, you're getting somehow a sum over all finite quotients of this thing. This is basically, the, the automorphisms of this are basically an SL2z. We can sort of, it's an order two thing here and an order three thing here. Notation. Um, so you're seeing some form of, of, so is it possible that some infinite dimensional widget is, is somehow concentrating? Um, second place where there's, there's, um, there's uh, infinite dimensional geometry, if you want, or, well, it's the matrix models, I suppose. but. So let's write it down. I don't have much to say there. Um, but the third is, is also the interesting thing, is the, um, the locus for all of these integrable hierarchies, whether it's KP, KDV, et cetera. Um, is the uh, sort of semi-infinite Rasmanian. Okay, so you've got, take a Hilbert space, which is L2 to the circle, and that's, that's a place where the circle could act. Right? Um, You have the um, the split. So Fourier series, positive frequency, neurological line bond on the Grassmannian. Sort of the the um, final element is a group. We call gamma plus, which is just the group of functions um, so it's an abelian group e to the sum the parameters are ti z to the i so it's in other words it's exponential of a, of a series 
acts on uh, L2 of the circle implies on the Grassmannian also. And you're already seeing some, I mean, going from here to here is already complicated because you're acting on all the vectors at the same time. And you're acting on L. And you can define tau, tau of tau zero. Choose a plane, a base plane, tau zero, tau n. Okay, to be what? Well, it's going to be, um, ah, one last element. You can choose a basic section here. So it might be the dual topological bundle. But there's a basic section. Okay, and it's just going to be S of, um, gamma t times a plane over gamma t times a w. Now, um, that should be essentially f. Now, there are various intriguing things. First of all, um, this gives you some sense, the, the universal solution to this sort of bigger hierarchy. KDV is a sort of special case of this. KDV is a sort of periodic case. In fact, there's a sort of smaller Grassmann you can use, which is, is just the modeled on the loop space of, of SL2 or GL2. Um, but you see, somehow the ingredients are they're sort of there. Um, Got the circle action. I should say now that we've sort of seen this a little bit, the 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 Virasoro action uh, and the KDV flows don't necessarily commute. the The fact that they sort of solve the the two are linked here is a sort of very particular case of the. It's it's very particular to that particular solution. Uh, the other thing I wanted to say is there's already. Um, um, Riemann surfaces here, but they're completely different. So an individual Riemann surface will give you a solution. These are quasi-periodic flows, basically. So um, you define the plane W to be H0. You choose a line bundle. You choose some trivializations to, to make things live in L2 of the circle. And you allow poles of infinite order. I mean unbounded order at a point. And um, that gives you um, a plane which sort of fits into this, this formalism once you've chosen the right coordinates. Um, the action of gamma t is basically just acting on transition functions for the line bundle at that point in your, in your chosen parameterization. Okay. And so it gives you, in fact, a flow of line bundles on the Riemann surface. And that's, but from that, using this, this formalism, this function tau, which in this case is essentially a theta function. So a theta function gives you this, this solution. So the Riemann surfaces are already there. On the other hand, the one that comes out here is completely different. It has no, no link to anything. Um, but it would be nice, the matrix integrals, linking the matrix integrals, and you've got some elements here. You've got a, a determinant bundle, so, you know, for, for example, if you had a, um, a Fred Holm operator, you're, you're getting close, your volumes, things like that. But the link to, to an infinite graph. On the other hand, this, this graph period picture, once you see the integral in coordinates, you sometimes wonder if this Konsevich, it's not a statement about the moduli of Riemann surfaces, but it's a statement about trivalent graphs. Anyway, so thanks for your patience. It's been fun. <laughs> and, uh, Thank you for uh, the lecture. Oh, that's, uh, very kindly and well, it's been a, it's been a pleasure. Yeah. Anyway, thank you for thanks for inviting me. It's always fun to come here. A bit long in the airplane, but <laughs> otherwise, great fun. Thanks. Any questions? Or? Hmm? Is there a comparable model for PG in general? For, for, for PG for other groups and for 
Oh, for BG, for other groups. That's a, an interesting. Hmm. Well, I mean, there, there's certainly there, there are a whole bunch of models for, for BG, right? I mean, the, starting with, with Will Milner's original construction. They're, they're sort of all, you know, in the same ballpark, basically. Um, you know, you, to make things contractible, you have to be able to sort of shove things off to infinity, basically. Um, so you get some sort of infinite sequence. Here, it's, it's very particular. It's also a cheat, right? I mean, it's not quite free as an action. Yeah. Um, could you do the same with, with, I mean, I suppose you'd just take, a, take values in G, and you'd have, I mean, you don't have really good coordinates in an arbitrary group. Well, I suppose you do, they're called matrices. But. Yeah. Um, no, it's not. I don't know. It's, it's, uh, yeah. No, you're, you're right, though. The, the Virasoro, the general. The general conjecture is, is uh, I suppose, from the point of view of integrable systems, you're seeing somehow this, this Virasoro is picking out the, the which which plane in the in a Siebel Wilson Grassmannian to, to orbit. And so, so from that point of view, if you had a more general operators, maybe you, you'd see it that way. Like I said, it's, it's one, one very particular plane. And it's almost, I think, characterized by the fact that it uh, zero annihilates things. So maybe that's uh, Uh, well, it's interesting because they, they, I think it'd be a different, different vault. I mean, here it's obviously is a different, I mean, here it's, it's using this, this uh, sort of Scrabble picture. Um, but I believe that, that uh, there's a sort of alternate proof by Miyazakani. Yeah, and she uses the Bob Peterson. Yeah. So that is a totally different It's a very different proof, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, she again has these coordinates where she's looking at sort of geodesics on the thing and sort of measures how, how much they twist and things like that. Right? They, uh, and so similar, similar in spirit. But somehow getting beyond the, the recursive, I think, sort of in, in, in understanding what's going on, I think, is a sort of challenge. Right. Okay, well, thanks again.